All right. Uh, I don't think I'll speak for 45 minutes. At least that's not my plan, um, both for you and for me. I think that's better. Um, so first of all, uh, thanks a lot to my society and uh, Gemma, Rebecca, and Mark for this invitation. I mean, anybody who works in that area is a big fan of my society, so it couldn't be a greater honor to be here. Um, also, thanks to um, Google and the Carter Foundation for the drinks as well, which will be important. Um, and it's also a pleasure to be back in Florence because I did live here for five, six years. So um, it is great to come back for my society conference uh, here. So let's go. And Civic Tech, as you see uh, there, there's my name, but there's also the name of two who had to say my research partners, key research partners, uh, Frederick Joburg and Jonathan Mellon, even though everything I say here is not my fault, it's not their fault, and it's nor the fault of all these people who have been working with us uh, throughout uh, the years at different moments. It's good to see some of them here, uh, Matt Hiking from Aptivate, but throughout these years, some of the stuff that we have produced wouldn't be, wouldn't be existing. Some, on most of it wouldn't be possible if it uh, wasn't the support of so many brilliant uh, and enthusiastic people. So, Let's start. How many of you know what this is? Please raise your hands. All right. Uh, not you. That's unfair. Uh, you. Yeah, yeah. It is the um, optical telegraph, which is also known as the Napoleonic telegraph was created by the brothers Schapp a bit, uh, a bit after the uh, uh, French Revolution. And the way that it worked, it was that this mechanism on the top would send signals from one to the other, relaying one message to the other. So it was the first time, well, actually there were some African drummers who could do that as well, but it was one of the first times that um, messages could travel faster than horses. And this was a big thing. So it was information technology. And if there's one thing that we see across history is that every time a new information technology comes up, people get excited about its democratic, its civic potential. So here's what one of the great intellectuals uh, of its time, Alexander van der Mond, said. I hate to read PowerPoints, but I have to do that. So one of the things that he says, the invention of the telegraph is a new factor that Rousseau did not include in his calculations. Poor Rousseau, right? It can be used to speak at great distances as fluently and as, and as distinctly as in a room. There is no reason why it would not be possible for all the citizens of France to communicate their will within a rather short time in such a way that this communication might be considered instantaneous. I think that sounds familiar to some of you, right? And what is interesting as well is that, and van der Mond goes on on a almost rant when he's writing about this, um, saying that this code at the time, because it was used for, for military purposes, um, was encoded so other people couldn't know what it was. So there were lots of people that said, okay, the civic potential of the telegraph will be unlocked once we open the code. Now, is that familiar? It was the first civic tech and open source code movement at the same time. Now, it doesn't change as we move. Uh, with the radio and telephone, you have similar speeches coming. And well, all I want to say is that all these people at a moment in history were excited as we are about the potential of technology. So here again, uh, an article in the San Francisco Chronicle that says pretty much that now we can come back to the old Athenian model of democracy because people can communicate to each other and distances don't exist. Then with the invention of cable television, you had a huge excitement around democracy and technology. So you had lots of, of experiments in what would people would call, it was the teledemocracy era, um, in which pretty much the idea is you'd have like cable TV and people would be able to communicate their preferences via cable TV. So this is a very, uh, 
well-known example. It's the cube uh, in Columbus, Ohio, in which the cable set, you also had this type of remote control and where people could be consulted. So here you have some uh, news from the uh, New York Times, I think it's from uh, 78, that starts saying, last night the people of the prosperous little suburb of Columbus lifted a finger for electronic democracy. And then again, the French get excited with it again, with the Minitel, which is the precursor of the web, uh, in which lots of experiences started as well. So you had the project Aspazi, you had the project Teletel, and you also had the interactive city council, where citizens, city council would meet and citizens could send their messages. Actually, that's how I got involved, because I actually worked in the city of Isilia Molino, and that's how I got into this stuff. I'm not as old as the Minitel, though. Um, now, moving a bit forward, internet comes, and there is this sentence, this quote by Al Gore that shows that holds an extreme resemblance to what Vandermond was saying. No, so this uh, he's talking at the International Telecommunications Union, and he's talking about the global information infrastructure. This is what Al Gore says: the GII, global information infrastructure will not only be a metaphor for a functioning democracy, it will in fact promote the functioning of democracy by greatly enhancing the participation of citizens in decision making. And it will greatly promote the ability of notions to cooperate with each other. I see a new Athenian age of democracy forged in the fora of the G that the GII will create. So from Vandermond and every technological innovation, we think technology will do something. Uh, very, let's say, a bit uh, grumpy, but brilliant uh, sociologist, Armand Matela, looking at this historical evidence, he says, well, there wasn't civic tech yet, that was in 1999, but that's what he says. This is all a strange alchemy of cynicism, naivete, and amnesia. And this is the moment that I lose the connection with you guys, right, and I lose your sympathy. Um, so, now, as in every moment in history, we might think, well, now something is different. So how different is it? And let's uh, try to look at it. So uncivic tech. So what am I calling about civic technology? And I'm going to be uh, very, let's say, uh, limited. And I do take the point that you all can make that civic tech is much more of than that. But as somebody who worked primarily with participation, participatory institutions, I look at civic tech as technologies that are designed to promote hopefully inclusive participation and also that promote government's response that on the other hand is inclusive itself. And I'll explain to you that. So why, is, why do people normally get excited with technology across history? So one of the things is that we're lowering the transaction costs. Right? which is in itself a bit of an irony, because lowering the transaction costs and believe that people will participate, it's a very rational choice actor type of thing. And if you're a rational choice person, you're not participating for the public good, you're participating to maximize your gains. But I'm gonna leave that contradiction aside, but we're excited about it because it makes it easier for people to connect, to participate, and so on. So who participates in civic tech? I mean, my society and Rebecca already did amazing work on that, and I'm just gonna present some of our findings that go uh, along with their findings and that also show some of the nuances that we have been finding lately. Um, this is uh, looking at predictors of online participation in the state of Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil, where they do the largest participatory budgeting process in the world. Well, now they compete with Paris. But um, so you have online and offline voting, and we ran surveys with both online and offline voters, and we tried to look what are the predictors of, actually this was only with online voters, what are the predictors of identifying yourself as an online only voter? What we find first thing to be uh, an online, strongest predictor to be an online voter is to use social networks. But afterwards come a pattern that we see often in other studies. You're more likely to be male, and you're more likely to have a higher income and more education. Right? And in a process that was created to redistribute resources uh, to the poor people, as in 
the case of participatory budgeting, you might start wondering what is happening there. You report a uh, very well-known initiative for those working with development because people say, oh well, people in Africa, they might not have the internet, but everybody has mobile phones. That's how normally the thing goes, and we can do civic tech in developing countries with mobile. So uh, together with uh, Matt, who is here, the Institute of Development Studies, uh, there was an evaluation looking um, at who votes, who participates in your report. Your report is a system that normally just runs surveys with young Ugandas, asking them on different issues about uh, do you trust your MP, what, what are your needs, and so on. And supposedly those, those messages that come crowdsourced, they're conveyed to the government so that the government can take action on different things. So we went to look and um, the, um, to do a household survey and also asking people basic questions. First of all, this is from a house, household survey in which we ask like, do you know how to use SMS, right? Uh, as you can see, people who had phones, 49.5% 49 49 of them did not know how to use SMS. This is one lesson here that you might take away. The fact that person has a technology, don't believe that they know how to use it automatically. And there's another curiosity here, because people many times, they say, I know how to use SMS, and they use SMS. But it's because they know only how to reply. They don't know how to start an SMS. And here's one thing. Look at this detail. How do you join your report? You join your report by texting the word join. So those people who say that can use SMS, maybe many of them, cannot join your report because they cannot start an SMS. And how do they compare? The U-Report users, we, we ran a survey with the U-Report users and also a household survey. So demographics, as you see, uh, primary school on the household survey, it's over 50% of the people have uh, um, primary school only. But when you go to see uh, the users of your report Less than five percent, uh, about yeah, less than five percent will have uh, primary school. Most of them are high, 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 highly educated. You also find the bias, male and female, and so on. So traditional biases that we're seeing, tools that are promoting to some degree not inclusion but exclusion. But it's not all bad news. Things change over time. So here we coded the names looking at data of Fix My Street that my society provided to us, uh, and we're very thankful for that. So you coded the names, names of women versus names of men, and we start to see how they participate. And you can see that Fix My Street started with very few female participation, but as it went across time, female participation increased. So there's also these nuances at which stage the uh, technology is, and you should not always be saying it's promoting inclusion or exclusion, as I just did, actually. Um, here there's another good news, is the website, one of the largest ones for uh, civic activism online is change.org in which we downloaded uh, quite a good amount of data, uh, 3.9 million petitions we downloaded uh, from uh, change.org's API and actually what we found uh, across 132 countries is that women participate more systematically more than men. But then it brings to another dimension that I want to talk on inclusiveness is that there are different types of inclusiveness and different types of participation. And here there's this distinction, thick versus thin participation. So thick participation is something that demands you a bit more time and thin participation is the push button democracy, the clicktivism kind of stuff. So when you look at petitions across the world uh, on change.org, what you find is that women sign much more petitions than men, but men are more likely to create petitions. So here's one thing. If women are participating more, but men are creating those petitions, are men setting the agenda? And women coming and following that agenda? I'm going to come back to that later. 
Another thing of participation we need to understand is looking from an international level. People participate not only because of gender or because of their income and so on. So here what we did is that we mapped the connections across countries in uh, change.org. And one of the strongest predictors of participation at the international level, well, not surprising, is language, but it's also cultural heritage, common colonial history, and business flows. So this is just to illustrate predictors of participation. They go beyond only the traditional demographic uh, stuff. But let's forget the issue of inclusiveness and move to another thing. When people participate, do governments respond? Here's a study looking not at developing countries, but, but we're looking at developing countries precisely and not developed countries that I did uh, with uh, Jonathan Fox. He looked at 23 cases of civic tech and tried to see the extent to which governments responded. First of all, it's extremely difficult. You have like websites that are extremely, extremely famous celebrities in the civic tech field, but in US, like, do you have any data on whether governments are responding, on whether it makes the difference that you purport to want to make? And it's extremely difficult to find data about it. And they don't have it or they don't want to share it. What we found is that majority of them failed. Lots of people participate, but governments were systematically failing to respond. So pretty much what we find is that while civic tech platforms is relevant for the capacity of policymakers to respond when they want, we didn't see lots of changes on the willingness of these people to respond. So it seems to work when the will to respond is already there. But then it's not really a policy problem anymore when people are already willing to respond. And when governments respond, who do they respond to? Fix My Street, we took, at, we took the data and looked at the texts and so on to see with which are the predictors of government responsiveness in Fix My Street. So first predictor that we find is that if you say please on a report, it's more likely, which is very British, of course. Um, if you had a photo, um, you do increase a bit the odds of having a report fixed on Fixed My Street, and if you're a male. So the bias is not only on who is participating, but the bias is also on the response. And when you put these three together, this is what I call the polite male with a camera effect. <laughs> okay, so going back to change.org. So, we look at what are the predictors of having a successful petition. And what is a successful petition? It's a petition that contributes to the change that it is asking for. So uh, pass this law, uh, stop acid, uh, make a new law against acid uh, crimes against women in Uganda, and so forth and so on. So as you can see, as you go up the number of, of petitions, the number of signatures, the success, the odds of success goes extremely up. So what we find is that women mobilize more signatures than men. So in average, when a woman starts a petition, she gets 432 uh, signatures and men 273. Women, not surprisingly, also have different preferences than men. The type of petitions that women start are different. So, in the end, what you find is that women-created petitions are 1.4 times as likely to be successful as male-created petitions. So, here's the thing. What is interesting is that even if men are the ones creating a higher number of petitions, systematically, women are better at mobilizing. So, in the end, they have the final word. Also, another thing that we looked internationally, who governments respond to, we look democracies versus autocracies. So in democracies, if you take a democracy, and uh, because of my job, I cannot be saying lots of names of countries. So if you take a democracy, uh, a democracy is extremely responsive to its domestic audience, but if you make it for other audiences, it, they do not respond to petitions that are started abroad. When you go to an autocracy, it's the opposite. If you're in an autocracy, petitions that are starting in that country, no matter how many 
signatures they give, they don't give a damn. But when it's like people from abroad who are making those signatures, they become responsive. So governments are even, even the type of regime will determine who is getting a response to or not. And here's a surprise that we have. Another thing that we found looking at change.org uh, is that civil society organizations are not more efficient when they start a change.org uh, petition if you control for the number of signatures. That is quite surprising because you would expect civil society organizations sponsoring a petition that they have more capacity, knowledge, and political acumen, and so on, but no, they're just as efficient as an individual, which is kind of different with all the literature and accountability and all the expectations that we have around participation and accountability and government responsiveness vis-a-vis -vis the role of civil society organizations. We're not saying this is a pattern in other places, but we do find that on change.org, which also raises questions about what's the role in place of organized civil society in this new type of mobilization. But what I'm trying to get you here is that institutional design matters, and we often forget about it. Politicians, they are always at each other's throat when there's some type or just the conversation over an, of an electoral reform because it is the institutional design. But in civic tech, we just do the institutional design without many times taking into account what consequences that may have. I'm not gonna go into detail here, but this is a way to put digital uh, civic engagement or civic tech. No, and the traditional way that you would expect is that you have a participant profile, right? So somebody comes and participate. This participant profile may be equal or unequal. That translates into certain types of demands. These demands will be equal or unequal. And once the government responds, that will be equal or unequal. All that I'm saying is that there is a chain that you start with the profile of participants and you think that it will have an impact all the way when the response from government comes. What you find actually is different institutional designs who lead to different models. So change.org, uh, you have more women participating, but you have more men uh, more men trying to determine the agenda in, the pract in practice, but because of its design, because it's the number of signatures that matter, you end up having a gender-inclusive model. Fix My Street pretty much reproduces. So participants are different, and governments will respond according to those differences. You take participatory budgeting, which has a curiosity because at the very beginning, the criteria for selecting projects are, is redistributive process. Even though you have inequality or when you may have inequality at the beginning with richer people participating, the final outcome of the process is still redistributive. So there is really a way in which you're organizing participation and at which point decisions are taken, how options are selected, and who participates, that it is that together that you do if your technology is civic or uncivic in terms of promoting, for instance, values that people pursue as equality or redistribution. Another thing that I think that it is the moment, and uh, here I, get, I will get closer to uh, concluding, is we need to understand better responsiveness. We've been focusing a lot on the profile of participants, and I think that we start to have a vision of who participates. We, it's something that we can handle, including with institutional design. But what makes governments respond for us is it still very unclear, or even when it is clear for us, we seem to forget that the moment that we're designing civic tech. So just here's an example. Uh, in Russia, how many of you have seen this? Uh, in, so in Russia, there was like this series of potholes in the cities. And so this guy, he started to do these graffitis with the face of the governor uh, around the city. Right? And I mean, 
government was very, very responsive, as you can see, it did that. <laughs> so, I mean, this is a good, what makes governments tick and what makes them tick in the right way and, and not in the wrong way. So, just going back here because um, I talked to my colleagues and I said, well, we want to close the talk proposing my society some joint work, further joint work. Here's one thing that has always fascinated me. We know that fix my street, well, most likely works because in principle one could say that those things that get fixed, they're just a random event because governments fix potholes anyway. And given that not 100% of the potholes here are fixed, one could make a hypothesis that it's just a random event. Although it is unlikely because we do find different patterns on what is getting fixed or not. But you still left with three questions about fix my street. One, considering it works, why does it work? One, it can be the governments take action based on their access to distributed information. So, Fix My Street could be just like a closed system in which I would send an email to the government and the government would fix it. So it is about knowing that there is a pothole. The other one is that governments are taking action because there is a naming and shaming effect. So I'm doing that because it is public and it shows my rates. And maybe, and very likely, governments take action for both of the reasons above. And even, but even if that's the case, we don't know which degree, which one has the strongest effect. Why is it extremely important knowing that? Because if you know that, you can design a much better fix my street. If the effect is more about distributed information, you're gonna try to find ways to, be, to create more flows of information and better type of information that is more actionable for the government. If it is naming and shaming that is what's at play there, you want to give salience to governmental action or lack thereof, maybe by creating rankings and doing all the types of shaming that one could do and I could think of many. All of this to say that we really, really, really need to start be thinking how the process of response operates and even behavior insights. So uh, people talk lots about nudges, but it's always about the citizen. We nudge the citizen. Can we nudge governments? That's one question that we should be thinking. Is there, are there ways to make governments more responsive? All of that because we are in a new moment, which brings to a final question and a final reflection. Everything that I presented here and which represents the core of what I work with is stuff that we do in between elections. That was great 10 years ago. Things were going great. Europe was funding e-participation, uh, lots of funding, because we, we seem to have hit the end of history. Thank you, Fukuyama, didn't work. So um, the final question that I want to say is, at this moment, how much should we be focusing on what happened in between elections or on what happens in elections as well? And I think that understanding what technology can do in these different places and what can make governments respond and how we can make more inclusive, it, it is what will make us different from our historical predecessors. And um, if we don't do that, our fate of civic tech and everybody else is here will not be very different of that of the Napoleonic Telegraph. Thank you. Uh, Anthony Zakhachevsky from the Democratic Society. Uh, fantastic talk as always, Tiago. Thank you very much for that. I was really struck by the, um, the uh, ridiculous optimism of the people you quoted right at the start about how technology was going to change things. And I wanted to kind of highlight a, a question for you about how, what do you see as the kind of the slow and steady incremental improvements that are happening 
um, which have actually moved democracy on and have actually moved communications on. Because at the same time as people were saying, oh, the Napoleonic Telegraph is going to be amazing, it's going to be the new Athens through the Napoleonic Telegraph, which was obviously wrong, there were also slow, steady political improvements that were being driven by that sort of communication. So can you point us to a couple of bright spots that you see around the world where new communications technology is being used to make things a little bit better for a lot of people rather than crazily, ridiculously better in five minutes, which is never going to happen? As you can see, I'm, I'm a bit of a pessimistic. So um, I would say, first of all, most of these low and steady improvements in, in the area of promotion of participation, democracy, electoral or non-electoral, they were never a technological matter. They were a regulatory, legal, and institutional matter. But in the, in, the, in the area of using technology, I think there, uh, there are two things that are interesting. One are those initiatives that, are, that plug into already existing institutions that can work. So actually, electronic voting in Brazil made a huge difference because it made much easier for illiterate people to vote. And when that happened, the name, but you increased the, the inclusiveness of the process, and now you, and you ended up having more redistributive policies because those who represented their views started to become more elected because people could cast their vote correctly. So it was plugging into elections and making elections function better. Right? Um, same thing for uh, participatory budgeting. When it is working, technology can come and add, but as long as you're making it multi-channel, and I'm very skeptical of online-only initiatives. But so I would say the bright spots will normally be on those that build on existing institutions, but also that combine online and offline, technical and digital and analogical. Hello, I'm Rosie McGee from Making All Voices Count and IDS UK. Thanks, Tiago, that was really interesting, and, and I feel like it adds some much needed kind of critical thinking to this sector at this moment. I wanted to ask specifically about the relationship between responses and responsiveness, because one of my kind of abiding niggles about a lot of feedback-based uh, civic tech initiatives is that they seem to focus on getting responses, but as I see it coming at it from a kind of more policy anthropology type point of view, there's a really big difference between getting a lot of responses and being becoming a much more responsive governance culture. So how would you define the difference between, or how would you sum up some of the differences between responding a lot and uh, changing in governance culture so that the government or the service provider agency is fundamentally sustainably more responsive? Yeah. Well, well that's, that's, that's an excellent question. And I think there's two levels if we make this distinction between response and becoming responsive. Uh, the first dimension I would say is basically one is tokenistic. Uh, it is I just respond because we created, particularly in the civic tech and development world, this close the feedback loop thing, and uh, we didn't we underspecified what closing the loop is. So sometimes just saying, yeah, thank you for your input, but we really can't do it. Right, so this is the first level of you may be given a response and not being responsive. But there are other problems. So we've, we have been researching um, a, a rather high profile 311 uh, initiative in the United States, which is a kind of fix my trade 311 and you call people. What we see is that making 311 calls public created a incredible pressure on making response, on closing cases. But what makes it is that you move from being a strategic person who tries to address structural needs, we have a problem with education, and as opposed to that, you start fixing lamps on schools. So I think there's also this dimension. And it is another dimension as well of naming and shaming that many times it might be leading to response, but not to responsiveness. And here responsiveness, what I'm saying is that you try also to respond in more structural ways that many times is not the most obvious, at least in the short term. Hi, uh, Shara Srinivasan from Cambridge University and Africa's Voices Foundation. Uh, really loved the presentation and I think it set a really good tone for these two days. There's one thing I'm not sure I quite agree with and I think it links to your answer just now. And that is uh, that 
communication technologies also do change political cultures and forms of political organization it links to responsiveness so um, i think if you hold institutional design too static in a sense you don't see that actually even though things didn't change and become like a thing in democracy um, the telephone for example really changed the nat nature of party organization in the united states um, and sources of mobilization and legitimacy change with that as well and so linking back to Rebecca's point about fake news and youth disaffection um, and disengagement, um, one of the real challenges, the bigger challenge within which all of this sits is how is the digital changing political culture and the nature of political organizations. So we might you know, push for short term advantages and nudging governments, etc. But something collective is important that's going on and fighting for that, that, that political culture that reflects a digital age in a positive way is crucially important to, I think, the work that goes on here. So I just think we should be careful not to sort of fix the institutional design bit as if it's something that is just given. It's really in a chain, you know, process of change. Yeah, no, no point taken. When I, when I started, I tried to define what I was looking at. Wasn't looking at fake news or anything of that. That is a big part of the big picture. But again, and that was like a parenthesis that I wanted to do, but didn't do for the sake of, of things. Telegraph, TV, radio, and everything, they changed, but not the way that this crowd and that crowd wanted to change. So if anything, yes, we might be barking up the wrong tree, right? And um, once, once more, did change party mobilization, politics, and everything. So they changed when they were plugged in existing structures. So that is the way that I'm. Hi, uh, Christopher Wilson, University of Oslo. Uh, thanks, that, that, that was great. And it seems to me a, a useful first sketch of, of what uh, Rebecca called the, the emerging evidence base. Um, I am struck though by, by how it is in many respects uh, incredibly spotty. Um, and some of the, the most concrete findings we have uh, apply to very specific contexts. It's not entirely here how they translate to different contexts. Some of it seems as though it should having to do with you know, the, the publicness of citizen voice or the, uh, the responsiveness of autocracies and democracies to internal or external petitions and stuff like that. And while that kind of thing is useful for, for global actors and donors and people who support the building of tools and comparisons, it's less obvious how to translate that into in-country practice. And I'd love to hear what you have to say, because we, I don't think we can expect that. We hope that people building um, mobile civic tech solutions in Eastern African countries will know whether or not people know how to use SMS. If they don't, it's not clear that they'll learn that by reading research reports or by talking to the people who do. So how, how do you think we can translate the emerging evidence into actual program design in country? Yeah. So, so the, the first a quick word on, on context matters, right? I, so if context matters, that brings you to a problem because then if we push the context matters thing to an extreme, then policy knowledge ceases existing, right? Then it's always about the context and going to learn from zero, start from zero. So I just say that there's a tension between uh, context matters and not reinventing the wheel that is not very addressed in this space. Um, in terms of practical issues, I think there are some very practical issues, and now I'm saying as somebody who comes from participatory governance and not talking about technology. I don't understand the obsession of civic technology with participatory mechanisms based on self-selection. I mean, this is 60s participation, you know? We moved on, you know, there's stratified modes of selection, randomized modes of selection, and everything, for instance, to try to solve the issue of, of, of uh, biases, participation biases. That's the first thing. The other one is methods. We use the different methods, more deliberative or aggregative, so send me an SMS, yes or no, or let's have a debate. It is very obvious which type of thing lends to one another. You don't want to do an aggregative type of process, maybe, to ask people whether they want to belong to a polity or not. You probably would want something that is more deliberative, at least a part of that. So, no, I think there are lots of, and I'd be happy to, of, of afterwards adding some slides of practical applications for that, because many of them are obvious. Um, and yes, and not, and there are the so obvious ones, but they're still not done. 
I mean, I, I've been asking people who develop uh, civic tech websites, how many times did they sit down with the users and saw how they use it? And you'd be shocked how many of them do it. And when they call the user, the user is their buddy, their mother, the aunt, and that kind of stuff. So even the obvious stuff we're not doing, but be happy to go beyond the obvious stuff at some point. Hi, uh, this is Ludwig from Delib. Um, in your government responsiveness study, uh, were government deployed civic tech platforms also associated with low responsiveness, or is it just the grassroots platforms mainly? Uh, do governments basically ignore things that weren't their idea to begin with? No, not necessarily. Not necessarily. So you'd find some, some tools like Fix My Street or, or um, I Change My City in India, in which they were let's say not government started platforms. But what we do find is that when there's partnership between government and civil society organizations, responsiveness go up. But there are exceptions. The mass mobilization ones, like change.org, uh, that are more collective action type of stuff, uh, they uh, will have, um, th what they depend of is mobilization and not whether government started it or not. Change.org is more effective than most e-petition websites started by governments. So. Um, <clears throat> morning, everyone. It's Jose Rodrigo from Royal Holloway, University of London. And thank you for the presentation. Maybe linking back to the last question, uh, what's your view on then the government digital units? Uh, talking about institutional redesign, I think one of the consequences of this big uh, premise of technology is openness, but it has led to create very compact units, like in the UK, the government digital service, you know, working under certain standards. I think they might need to be part of this picture of responsiveness. And I'd like to hear your views about it. Yeah, I, I mean, it's complicated one, because I wouldn't dare speaking about uh, government digital services in the UK, who in my opinion are doing one of the most interesting works uh, in that area. How transferable that is to other places, um, I find it difficult because normally when you try to transfer that, it is in the government's cabinet and it works for three years and then government changes and the thing dies. But, the, the, and here's one problem. Uh, the people who are many times doing the technology in this case, they are plugging into services that already work, which is good, and that's why things are working, but they're not creating new spaces of participation themselves, right? So I think here we need to do, make a distinction between e-governance, electronic governance, and uh, participatory governance, or better governance. Be and what I see is that they're being extremely successful, and here's a, my uneducated opinion on that, but the space that we're creating is more for access to services, improving it, and uh, improving very important things like organ donations and everything, but it's not creating more democratic spaces, not necessarily, but I might be wrong. Just a quick response to that. I think uh, the transfer you talk about is from government to somewhere else. I would also advocate that uh, transfer from civic tech to government. At the end of the day, government is the one who has most of the resources, no? So if we could import services from civic tech to government, we might be also making them a bit more sustainable. That's something to consider. Yeah, I mean, my vision of, of future, if, if we are successful, we, would have, we will have more and more governments doing their job and maybe less civic tech NGOs, uh, but that's not the case now, so that's why we need organizations like my society. Hello, I am Nere Leosk and I'm currently at the European University Institute, but I come from Estonia, where I worked in a government and later in a policy think tank. I have a comment, actually not a question, but Tiago is free to comment <laughs> on that as, as everybody else. Uh, there was a lot of talk of, uh, of the government and also politicians' responsiveness, so maybe I would just like to say that from our experience of, of 17 years of analyzing different platforms, uh, it, it all comes in a way to politics because these ideas or these petitions that have been implemented are either suitable for politicians, there is some political consensus, or in case of government, 
there is a right political momentum. And uh, the same applies also to these people who have submitted these ideas. They almost always have a very good political background or, or expertise, so they, in a way, realize what is feasible or, uh, or not. You, you, maybe you have heard the uh, um, latest People's Assembly that was implemented in Estonia, and, and from these ideas that were presented, almost 2,000, these were implemented, were actually profitable for, the, for these political parties that were in power at the time. So I don't know whether you have seen something similar from, uh, from your research. Oh no, po you. politics is all over there. I mean, if I respond on, on Fix My Street, uh, in, because it's public, it's because I want to be reelected as mayor and it's good for me. Or in change.org, I can choose to do things that I was going to do anyway. But if there is, if I start to see that there were two million, three million people, four million people signing something that I had not seen before, you're creating politics there. So yes, but politics is all over. Yeah. Hi, Elisa Zomer from the MIT Governance Lab. So I want to ask a question about the cost of participation. So earlier on in the talk, you talked about how civic tech helps make things cheaper. Um, and yet from political science, we kind of know that governments often listen to people who are making costly efforts to participate. So people that are either taking time away from work or taking time to like write up different statements. And so I just had a question about this issue of cost is cheaper, better, and how does that send a signal to governments about whether to be more responsive? Yeah, it's, it's striking a balance, right? Because you don't wanna, so when they were doing, when people were against, uh, po there's an old story when they're putting postal voting in Switzerland and people said, no, votes should be important. Uh, and so people should walk to the ballot. And there was an advocate of postal voting that said, well, but if you want that, why don't you put barbed wires around the ballot? Because then it becomes even more important. Because, so the thing is, um, Cost sometimes is an impediment for inclusiveness. Think the people who are physically disabled, right? Uh, so should you have internet voting in that case? Should we be enabling? So there's the inclusiveness dimension. But yes, I think what in politics now, what we're needing is more engagement, that people spend more time. Actually, we were having a group discussion yesterday. We even started to, to think some ideas that maybe before voting, people should have to spend like one or two hours talking and seeing what the options really are. Right, so we might have actually to be reintroducing the costs into politics uh, as long as we maintain inclusiveness.